Testament, Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. The glory of Zion. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense, and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The word of God for all the people. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the New Testament, uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The Magi visit the Messiah. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this news, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In, Beth in Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and had been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, for they returned to their country by another route. God, we have come from our homes to journey here this morning to experience your life and experience joy and fellowship and to worship you. As the wise men came to Bethlehem to worship Jesus, guide us now as we seek to understand your word in a broader sense. And may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. I love the idea of, of the wise men, uh, the families probably, more than likely it was a caravan. Traditionally, it talks about three wise men because there were three gifts, but it was probably a large group that set out, almost like a uh, uh, people going west way back in our history. And um, I can imagine that as this group of astrologers who have studied the stars say, there's a star that has appeared that is a sign of the Messiah being born. And so we're going to journey and follow that star. I, I can imagine people who weren't in on that uh, bit of astrology kind of uh, oh I'll say whoa they've lost it they've lost it y you're going to follow which star <laughs> up there 
And uh, no, you know, that, that's, oh yeah, that, oh I see, that one, sure. And being mocking and having a wonderful time teasing them. And you're taking your family with you in a caravan? And, you're, and you don't know where you're going? Wow. What great men you are, you idiots. <laughs> and uh, not unlike uh, the mocking that happened years ago to a uh, skipper of a ship who put out from a port on the Gulf of Mexico, headed for a port on the northeastern part of the United States, northeastern coast. The ship was not only small, but it was rusty, and it was it looked like it had been in the Civil War and uh, should have been sunk after the war. And uh, they, they said, where are you going? He said, I've got a date with the Gulf Stream. And we're going over to the northeastern coast. And they mocked him and they said, if that come, I don't think you're going to make it. What makes you think you can do it? And he said, because I've got a date with the Gulf Street. And the skipper was able to maneuver with the wind and a gifted skipper of a ship and to make the journey. And in a way, these wise men say, I have a date with the light that's in the star. Not the star, but the light in the star. I have a, we have a date with that. And we're headed out. And more than likely, it was a two or three year journey that they followed when that star first appeared. So it wasn't like they just ran down to Walmart for, uh, you know, for some camping supplies to, to last you through the week. No, they, they had a journey ahead of them. And they didn't know how long it was going to be. They aren't entirely unlike Abraham in the Old Testament. Who, when God came to him and said, you've got to go off, and he left everything. And um, when we come to this first Sunday of the new year, it's really an invitation not to make resolutions, but to uh, join in, a, in the adventure of living God's way and following the light and the star and where that takes us. Now, some of us may, may make resolutions. Uh, when I make them, I always look for the first Sunday in Lent because then I can give up my resolution for the year and, and then I'm all set. But uh, I, I like, uh, I, I recently came across Calvin and Hobbes uh, strip right after the first of the year in uh, Calvin's talking to his stuffed tiger, Hobbes. And Hobbes says to him, did you make any resolutions for the new year? And Calvin becomes highly indignant and shouts, no, I'm fine just the way I am. Why should I change? I think he should run for president. <laughs> because I think there's, well, anyway. In fact, I think it's high time the world started to change to fit me. And not that I have to change. I don't see why I should do all the changing around here. If the new year requires resolutions, I say it's up to everybody else, not me. I don't need to improve. Everyone else does. And uh, after he finishes his tirade, Calvin says, uh, yes, how about you, Hobbes? Did you make any resolutions? And Hobbes says, yes. Well, I had resolved to be less offended by human nature, but I think I blew it already. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, as we make our resolutions, it's really more for explorations, I, I would hope, and going forward and being open. When the wise men came to Jesus, they gave him gifts, three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh all representative of different parts of his life that would happen later on. But they came to worship. And they were sensitive enough to know that when Herod said, or the, you know, the ruler said, I want to go and worship, and 
sensitive in a dream that that wasn't what he was about. And we know what he did after that. He sent his troops in and killed all the male babies that were two years or younger. And so Jesus, with Mary and Joseph, fled to Egypt. And so, warned in the dream, they didn't go back to him, but they went home a different way. What were they worshiping? They were worshiping a sense that this life that Isaiah writes about, this light in the star, this source of life, this Jesus, was one who would bring them peace. Jesus said, I, I have come that you might have peace, and not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me also. It's really um, recently, or a while back, someone found a book that was dedicated to a man's sister and his mother. And he said, I dedicate this book to my mother and my sister who fought an incurable disease that gave them great pain and they suffered greatly from. But they were triumphant over it. And they were witnesses <coughs> to the power of God's grace, even in their pain. Jesus doesn't promise us a world where there's no turmoil, but a peace that overcomes it that in a sense is able to rise up above it. Some of us probably have gone through locks on ships. And it's always fascinating when you, the like first time when I went through a lock, I think was on a trip to Holland. And uh, woke up in the night and on both sides of the ship where we were, great cement walls, you know, and we're boxed in, and uh, I, I thought, this is a nice nightmare. <laughs> and then, uh, but you know, the ship is in there, and the, and the pilot doesn't say, go steam ahead. He cuts the engine down, basically idles it, I guess we could say. And he waits for water to come from above and push it, but you know, a button is pushed or something, the water comes in and it begins to lift that ship up. So it's equal with the water on the other side, it opens up and away it goes. I think when we trust the peace of Jesus Christ, that when we're down there at the lower level and it seems like we're blocked in, God gives us power and helps us to lift above it. Jesus tells us this, uh, if we follow him, that he will be the disturber of our loyalties. He said, I have come to set a daughter against her mother. He didn't say a daughter against the mother-in-law. Daughter against the mother. And a son against his father. Wow, that's really a wonderful text to preach for family day, but I, I won't preach it today. And, but, you know, but he really is saying there that you and I are guilty at times of having loyalties that need to be cut. And sometimes, just like when I emerge from my mother, they cut the tube that connected us, <coughs> That's why I got a little belly button. To be free. There are times in life 
when I have connected myself with different loyalties that are wrong, and God cuts it. Says you need to cut it. Loyalties to clan, to race. Loyalties to nations. Loyalties to money. Loyalties to this and that. He's the disturber of loyalties because he wants us to be free of being tied down by other things. And it doesn't mean that moms aren't supposed to love their daughters and sons their fathers or vice sons their mothers. But it means that there's a more primary relationship. That's why Jesus is the disturber. Because at times he can cheat me up. The light in the star is a source of power. Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. God raises us up. There's a wonderful story that Henry Van Dyke wrote. An author from the last century, a preacher. Many years ago he wrote it. It's called The Fourth Wise Man. If you've never read it, you know, uh, to check it out and get it. But I'll spoil the plot for you. Let's go read it. The fourth wise man tries to find Christ. And he gets his gets three jewels, expensive jewels, to take to worship him and tries to follow the rest of the wise men long after they had left. And as he begins his journey and goes, he's unable to catch up with with the wise men. But different things happen to him on the way. He encounters someone who is hurting real bad, and he ends up giving one of the jewels to that person. Continues, gives up the other jewel to the person. Continues gives up the other jewel, suddenly realize I don't have any gifts to bring to Jesus or you know to the Christ. But he continues searching, 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 and searching in this journey. He continues encountering people in need and helps them the best he can. And finally at one point as his life begins to draw toward an end, he realizes that he has met the Christ many times, every time, when he met somebody in need, he met Jesus. And that indeed he had been able to give his gifts to him. He brought light, the light which was reflected from the star. He brought light to those in darkness with his healing. A man brought a expense, or not a terribly expensive gift, but it was a uh, a matchbox of all things for his wife but it was a phosphorescent matchbox which was supposed to glow in the dark. His very ankle, he had wrapped it up, <laughs> kept it wrapped up for quite a while. Probably every man here got their Christmas shopping done about November 29th. Wrapped the presents and just kind of laughed at the women and said, oh, you hurry around, but we're so good, we, you know. And <clears throat> Don't tell the truth, no. <laughs> and so actually he has this wrapped up all this time and he presents it to her. And nothing happens. It doesn't glow in the dark. And he says, well, I guess I got cheated on that one. I'm sorry, honey. But she looked at the box the next day a little more closely. And found an inscription in tiny letters 
I mean, men don't read directions. If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the sunlight through the day. She did as directed, and that night after dinner, it was a pleasant surprise for her husband when she turned out the light and the matchbox shone with a brilliant light. It's true of that matchbox. It's true of us. When we accept Jesus Christ in faith, the light within us can glow. It can glow to lighten up the world that God has given to us. And we will not return home the same way, ever. But we will still go home. But we will be different persons, guided by our light. The light of Christ. May we change that.